what we were talking about. And if you don't, don't worry, I'll refresh your memory. Oh. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Radio waves. Radio waves, right, okay. Yeah. And frequency. FCC. FCC, very good. But you're right, we were talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And rather than try and get bogged down in the weeds on exactly how that works, and I don't know exactly how it works, I just know there's an electromagnetic spectrum all around us, and variance in wavelength is what causes different properties to carry essentially through the air and affect us, right? And so um, I'll back up a little bit for point of reference, but if you remember, we talked about on the primary, and you mentioned FCC, and that's really what this is about. The FCC regulates and helps distribute the different frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And this is called the radio spectrum. If you see right down there on the left, it says in red, the radio spectrum, okay? So that's what we're really, really dealing with here. Television, we talked about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all the things that travel through the air that we use every day. And we have to have some semblance of order or we're gonna have chaos and everybody fighting with each other and we don't want that. So okay. that band allocation, pretty squeezed down. You know, there's FM radio fits in that little section between 88 and 108 megahertz. And then we talked about how um, it's all a part of the entire spectrum, right? So all of that's important. I mean, look at how chopped up that is. And we're talking about like ship to shore radio and C, you know, CB, like citizen band radio and broadcast stations and all the rest of it. A GPS, everything that's going through the air on a wave is allocated right there. And most other countries around the world have followed pretty much in step with what the United States has laid out in their frequency, although it's a little bit different in Europe. They have different agencies, but they have international agreements so that they don't interfere with each other and mess everything up, because we don't want to do that, right? We want everything to be cool. So we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum and how there's different, you know, from radio waves down on the low end, all the way up to things like gamma rays that can kill you, because it's such a tight frequency, you know, um, if you watch, no, I don't know, you know, any of the science fiction stuff, right? And they have lasers and beams and stuff that kill people. Well, that's what they're talking about. That would be way up on the gamma ray uh, section of the spectrum, right? And so the FCC, they assign all that stuff, the power, not only what frequency you're on, but how much power you can have. There are radio stations that would be in Mexico, and this is years ago, they still have a couple of them. In the United States, years ago, AM was huge. I mean, that was really the big one, and FM was kind of experimental, right? And, but it sounded better, and it could be in stereo, and it was pristine, and the industry just didn't get it. They were used to being on the AM band, and in the United States, the most power you can have is 50,000 watts. And they had stations that they call clear channel stations, and clear channel actually became the name of a big company, but it's also a description, and they would be the only one, for example, WLS in Chicago, big AM station at 89 or 890 hertz. No other station in the United States could be on that same frequency, regardless of where they were. They could be thousands of miles away from Chicago, it didn't matter. They were a clear channel, and they were the only ones that had that frequency. And there were several of these around the country. Well, what happened was some of the operators wanted to have big, powerful stations that could blanket the United States as well. But there were only so many. So they went to Mexico and built stations that were 100,000 watts. They were twice as big. And they would just blanket all over Mexico, Central America, the United States, Canada, and all over the country. So it became really, really chaotic. And so what happened is these countries started to get together and say, look, you know, let's be nice to each other and peaceful. And they made laws so that we couldn't do that kind of stuff and have chaos anymore. So that's a little bit of the background. But the FCC played a major role in all that to make sure that didn't happen anymore. Uh, of course, they're the ones that issue licenses and they renew them every five years. Now remember that phrase, this one here. All broadcast stations must operate in the interest, convenience, and necessity of the public. 
Well, every five years, they review how did you live up to that? Because if you didn't, they would revoke your license or just not renew it. And then they would have an auction and somebody else would be able to have that frequency because there's only so many of them. I mean, I hate to equate it to a liquor license. It's a bad analogy in a sense, but that's why those kind of licenses are so expensive because there's only so many that the state of Texas, for example, will issue for any given jurisdiction. And that's why if you have one, well then, and you attach that to your restaurant, you can probably be profitable because that's where all the markup is, right? Food, there's not a lot of margin in food, for example. So it's like it's really, really competitive, just like this is, really competitive in the restaurant world and by serving food, the margins are razor thin. I mean, they're like one and two percent. Well, if you have a glitch, like, oh, gee, a pandemic, that really can upset. And that's why so many restaurants, for example, went out of business recently. Margins are thin. There's not a lot of room for error. But if you have a liquor license, well, there's huge margin in liquor. You know, they sell beer or wine or hard liquor. Well, the margin in it is huge, right? They charge like. I don't even know what a shot costs. I don't drink, but it's expensive. I know that. It's like, you know, probably three or four bucks or something. And it probably costs them about two fifty to buy the entire bottle. Well, they're gonna get how many, you know, twelve or fourteen or fifteen shots out of there or more. Do the math, right? That's where you make your money. Now in the restaurant business, the other way to make money, just as an aside, is through soft drinks. I don't know if we talked about this before, but it's amazing. McDonald's, right? We talked about this last week. McDonald's, like, our, for one cup, it costs less than a penny to make. And they said we'd probably buy the entire batch for, like, $10. Yeah. And we can make, like, thousands of drinks. That's we exactly charge, right. And every drink we charge is a dollar. So. Wow. So, okay. So, yeah, do the math, right? I mean, lots. Well, that's where, the, that's where McDonald's, for example, makes their money. They don't make it on the hamburgers. Because it's expensive to yeah. produce hamburgers. Yeah. Yeah. They say that um, soft drinks make more money than the actual food does for most fast food restaurants. Well, you're absolutely correct. And not only does it make more money, but exponentially makes more money. That's where all their profit essentially comes from. Because if you just sold hamburgers and french fries, for example, you can't pay the light bills. I mean, you can't pay your overhead, pay your employees and everything else, and still make a profit. You'd go out of business. So soft drinks, thank goodness for innovation that somebody came up with in 1885 or whatever it was, invented in 1875, somebody came up with Coca-Cola. Wow, what a great invention because it costs nothing to make and people love it and you can sell it by the barrel full and people will pay good money. Well, a buck, right? People are not hesitant to pay a dollar for a Coke. They think, well, wow, that's a good deal. Well, it costs a dollar. Can't buy anything for a dollar anymore. But we can get a large Coke, man. That's great. So anyway, that plays into this a little bit. But these guys are restricted. They have to operate in the interest, convenience, and necessity, or they're out of business. Internet does not have to apply by that rule. There is a section in the 1996. FCC Communications Act, it's actually the Communications Act, or a revision, made in 1996. And the Communications Act of 96 says that in a section 230, says that platform operators on the internet are not responsible for the content or for limiting content. For example, content, according to law, has to meet local standards. That's why people have cried foul, but you can limit obscenity and pornography and all that type of thing on your platform. There's no argument because it doesn't, it violates a community standard that's not accepted as normally things that we in society want to have out there to permeate the culture. And so there was an exemption because who knows where that line is exactly? What constitutes well, it's the whole hate speech issue, all right? Who here believes that we should protect hate speech 
And who thinks we should not protect hate speech? Who thinks we should protect it? Who thinks we should not protect hate speech? Interesting. Now, I didn't say who likes it or who wants it, but who thinks it should be protected? Now think about that for a minute. Because it begs the question, what constitutes hate speech? If I tell, let's see, I am Italian heritage, so I can tell Italian jokes and kind of get away with it, right, in this politically correct world we live in. Uh, how do you shut up an Italian? Tie his hands. <laughs> so, but we can't even tell ethnic jokes anymore in this brave new world we live in because everybody's so worried about offending everybody else that it's just kind of crazy. And, and Mrs. Peterson and I grew up in a different world than that where you're free. Well, some people will say, that's hate speech, what I just said. Mm. I don't think so, but you do. So where do you draw the line? And then, of course, the law gets involved in that whole thing. The Constitution in the First Amendment, who knows what the First Amendment says? This is very important, especially when it comes to broadcasting. Freedom of speech. Freedom of what? Speech. Speech? Religion. There's actually more than one freedom in the First Amendment. There are five of them. Who knows what they are? Religion. Religion, Press. speech. Press. He's Press. Loud, I can't hear very well. He said press. Press, you're right. Protest. Protest. I'm sorry, say it again. Protest. Yes. Uh, assembly could be a protest. And redress. And what redress means is if I have a violation against me, I have a legal right in the First Amendment of the Constitution to get to, to redress against the government of the United States for inflicting hardship or restriction of freedom on me, right? So you have five freedoms, that's just in the First Amendment.